Welcome again to Ask the Sioux. This month, we're going to look at phenomena that aren't talked about a whole lot on your usual TV weathercast, and that's gravity waves and wake lows, both of which can cause significant wind without a thunderstorm nearby. There are lots of sources of wind in the atmosphere. Probably the events that we most associate with strong winds are hurricanes, strong extratropical or winter storms, thunderstorms, and of course tornadoes, strong rotational winds. However, there are other phenomena that produce strong winds, sometimes seemingly out of nowhere or certainly not when you'd expect it. Two of those phenomena are gravity waves and wake lows, and that's what we're going to discuss in this month's episode. First, let's define gravity waves. They are a wave disturbance in which buoyancy, or reduced gravity, acts as the restoring force on parcels displaced from hydrostatic equilibrium. That's right out of the glossary of meteorology from the American Meteorological Society. There's a fairly common example of a gravity wave, and that happens to be an ocean wave. Here are some examples of gravity waves as seen by weather satellite images. First, here's Hurricane Gordon in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, you can see the ripple effect on the top of the thunderstorms that are really tall as they bump up against the stratosphere. Next is an example of gravity waves that are caused by the wind flow over the tops of mountains. Finally, here's a look at some low-level gravity waves in the western Gulf of Mexico. Again, you can see the ripple effect similar to what you might see in a pond or an ocean. So, how do these gravity waves form? Well, there are many different ways that they can form. One of the more common ways that gravity waves initiate are from convection or thunderstorms as we know them. Those generally initiate gravity waves either at the top or the bottom of the atmosphere. We can also get gravity waves from interactions with the jet stream. Wind shear in the atmosphere can also produce gravity waves. We can get gravity waves forced by strong fronts either near the surface or in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And as we showed in one of the satellite pictures, topography or mountains can also start gravity waves. So let's look at one pattern that's favorable for the development of gravity waves based on research. The first thing we look for is a strong mid-level low pressure trough to the west of a developing surface low. This can be shown in the schematic by the solid curved black lines. The second thing we're looking for is a strong jet stream maximum on the east side of the trough shown here by the cyan arrow. Next we want to find where the inflection point is between the upper level low to the west and the corresponding ridge axis to the east. Finally, we're looking for an area that's north of a surface warm front that extends eastward from an area of low pressure. The result is the shaded area shown in the graphic. So far we've talked about the initiation of gravity waves, but then the next question we have to ask is how do these gravity waves maintain themselves? Because gravity waves like to spread out in all directions, which would allow their force to weaken considerably over time. Well, we can get certain conditions in the atmosphere, which we call ducting conditions, that allow these atmospheric gravity waves to get trapped in a layer and maintain their strength. This most often happens when there's an inversion in the atmosphere which means that the temperature actually increases with height instead of decreasing height, which normally occurs in the troposphere. These conditions are most likely to be found near the stratosphere and also near the surface, especially at night. Now we'll talk a little bit about wake lows and how they can produce some locally strong and damaging winds. By definition, wake lows are surface low pressure area, meso low, or the envelope of several low pressure areas to the rear of a squall line most commonly found in squall lines with trailing stratiform precipitation regions, in which case the low is positioned near the back edge of the stratiform rain area. So let's take a look at a schematic of how these wake lows develop and why they cause such strong winds. First, you start with a squall line of thunderstorms, maybe along a coal front. Here's an example of what the radar might look like, where you have your heaviest rain right along the squall line. Then you get some lighter rain behind that, but on the back edge of the system, you again get into some moderate and possibly even a little bit of heavy rain as well. What happens is where you have that leading edge, the squall line, where the heaviest rain is, the cooling of the air because of the rain produces a small area of high pressure called a meso high. On the opposite end, towards the back, you get a small area of low pressure, a meso low, that develops. And the pressure gradient, if you remember from the last episode, is what forces the wind speed. So when you have such a tight gradient between an area of high pressure and low pressure, 
you get some very strong winds due to the pressure gradient force that flows from the high pressure towards the low pressure. So we're going to show you a couple examples of what this looks like in the real world. On the left, you see a satellite picture, and overlaid on the satellite picture are isobars, or lines of constant pressure, as well as surface observations. Notice in this image you have an area of high pressure and an area of low pressure, the meso-high and meso-low, which have developed fairly close to each other, causing these isobars to be very tightly packed together. This is creating very strong winds on the back side, and in fact in this case there's a gust over 60 miles per hour near the back edge by the meso-low, well away from where the strongest convection is. The next image shows what the radar might look like in a wake-low situation. You can see the strong leading edge of thunderstorms in the darkest red and the white and even some of the pink in there. And the precipitation rapidly decreases behind that leading edge line. However, if you go farther back, then there's another little band of some oranges and a little bit of reds indicating some moderate to locally heavy rain that aren't directly associated with the squall line of thunderstorms. On the back edge of that area of the moderate heavy rain would be where your meso low would develop. Now it's time for you to be the forecaster. I'm going to give you a jet stream level chart, a surface front and radar analysis, and an upper air sounding. You will guess, will there be a gravity wave in Charleston, or will there be a wake low in Charleston? So here's the jet stream level at 8 p.m. for this particular case. Charleston is marked in the star. A couple features of interest you can see that there's a strong upper level trough in the center part of the country, well to the west of Charleston. And there's also some very strong jet stream level winds on the east side of that trough. Here's the upper level data from the sounding at Charleston that evening based on the balloon that we launched. What I want you to pay special attention to is the solid back line that the arrow is pointing to which is the temperature trace through the atmosphere. Do you notice any specific characteristics that might be favorable for either a gravity wave or a wake low? Finally, let's take a look at the surface fronts and radar at 11 o'clock that evening. Again, the Charleston area is marked in the star. We can see an area of low pressure in southern Alabama with a cold front trailing to the south of it and a warm front extending to the east of it to the south of the Charleston area. Notice that there is a lot of shower and thunderstorm activity along and south of the front, and that activity is moving eastward into the western Atlantic Ocean. So, are conditions favorable for a gravity wave? Yes, they are. The upper trough and jet stream are in a favorable location. The area is north of the warm front, and the upper air sounding shows an inversion near the surface. How about a wake low? No. The squall line has passed too far south of the area to be a concern. Here's what happened that night. We had a gravity wave with very high winds in the immediate Charleston area, especially along the coast, where we had gusts as high as 65 miles per hour. We had a 40-foot sailboat sink with damage to 20 to 30 other boats, and unfortunately one boat owner had a severely injured hand. Here's an example of the pressure traces from both the Capers Inlet and Fripp Inlet buoys showing the very sharp drop in pressure marked by the gravity wave on the chart. Also notice on the right side the plot from Isle of Palms showing the pressure drop and the dramatic increase in winds associated with the gravity wave. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you next month.